excited. We have the lovely Vanessa with us this evening. We're super excited about um, having her come in. She is a local model in the area. And this evening we also have Chelsea painting with us mm -hmm. tonight and Alex Venezia is away, is back from his stint from the last one. So we're really excited about um, having both of them in. And without further ado, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Feel free to ask us questions. That's what this is all about. Feel free to paint along with us if you want. Go to, uh, there'll be a link below and you can go to access all of the reference images and you will be able to have the reference images for this evening. So uh, without further ado, we're gonna get started. If Kelly hasn't gotten the reference images up quite yet, she will, it, they will come in within the next few minutes. So um, check that out and refresh it if not, and we will get, uh, we'll get started. Sound good? So let us know everyone where you're coming, where you're calling in from. I just saw a hello from Colorado. Um, so glad that y'all are here joining us this evening. It's always, always a pleasure. And oh, also forgot to mention, Nick is behind the switcher tonight. So he is the lovely voice that you'll be hearing for the first half. And then that beautiful Australian voice of Divya's will come in on the second. So I was getting to know Vanessa earlier and she was telling me that she is, well, she has lived all over, but where I remember that she said she was from is more of the Chicago area. So there's like a really famous group up there, Vanessa called the Paint and Chisel, where a lot of <clears throat> very known painters have come out of, um, two of which actually now live here in um, North Carolina, uh, Scott Burdick and Susan Lyon, and dear friends of East Oak Studio. So, um, but yeah, it's one of those really cool places to go visit as, an, as a representational artist. Have you ever gotten to paint there, Louie? Actually, I haven't. Um, I, I haven't been back to Chicago since I knew about it. Um, so I was telling her, I went to high school close to Chicago and a small little boarding school called Culver Military Academy. And so I had a lot of friends from that area. But um, it's been a while since I've been able to go back. So looking forward to checking it out though the next time I'm there. I feel like it's kind of like Chicago's Art Student League. Yeah. You know? Have you been? I haven't and I'm like dying to go one of these days either for like a workshop or some, something. Yeah. Yeah. Let us know, everybody, if you've ever gone to the paint and chisel, checked it out. So, if y'all haven't noticed, uh, so North Carolina has some really bad pollen during sort of tree pollen season. Everybody's cars get caked with, with, um, with green or a lime, lime green slash yellowish color. And, um, well, it affects my voice. So for about a month or two, I sound like Barry White. And then, um, then it goes away. So if I want to sing all my sultry music, that's when I start doing it, you know. <laughs> Any of my, um, you know, I can, I can sing a mean, I walk the line right about now. <laughs> I'm curious how many cash. people actually noticed. Like, I don't, oh. I don't think I would have thought about it. You know, that's the funny thing is, is we're always so self-conscious about ourselves that we, yeah. we think everybody notices that, like, the main thing about us, and, and people are like, ah, you know, would have never thought. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Um, I was listening to a podcast about something very similar and it was talking about um, basically the science behind that. And so they had a guy walk into this, into this room that was, it was designed to be like a, a psychological study and everybody was in this waiting room for the psychological study. But what they didn't realize is, is that was yeah. the psychological study. Yeah. So many times, I, I feel like I'd be suspicious just going <laughs> to the place because I'd be like at any moment, be like, this is the real psychological study that they don't want to tell me about. But then they had one guy walk in and he was wearing like this bright yellow t-shirt that had like a green monster on it. And they did this in multiple different sessions. 
and um, they wanted to see how many people noticed. And so they asked the person who was wearing the shirt, how many people do you think noticed? And they were like, oh, it was like at least 80% of the people would notice because it's just an outlandish mm -hmm. shirt. And only, I think they said only 3% of the entire audience of people that were there would ever notice what they were actually wearing. Huh. So it's like, wow, we are so, you know, conscious about ourselves, but when it comes to that, so I thought that was interesting. Yeah. yeah, I wonder how you design something like that just because obviously when you, like you have to control, right? You have to have mm -hmm. a control group where nothing happens. And there's kind of this question of like, are people behaving differently because they know it's a study? Are they really distracted by you know, the thing they think is going to be what they're about to do, like what's their level of being able to attenuate to the environment relative to what happens mm -hmm. normally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sure that's something they have to actively, you know, plan around and control for. Um, absolutely. But yeah, I'm still curious, like how exactly that would look. Well, I, and I wonder, you know, because of course my memory could be um, mistaken on this, but I wonder if the other people that were in the waiting room were there for a study or if they did it at a doctor's office and the only person that was a part of it was the person wearing the t-shirt. I think so that would be interesting to see. Yeah, I think that like by definition it would have, sorry for touching my mic, everyone who just heard that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, oh darn it. Um, but yeah, I, I think by definition you, you have to have a degree of disclosure there, which means that it, people would probably be aware that something would be going on. Um, that's a good question. I don't think that they have to um, in order for it to be, you mean as like an ethical study? Yeah, so any anything would go through like IRB approval um, and it's only like kind of exceptional cases where you can kind of pull a fast one. Um, so my assumption is that people would probably, and, and based on like other studies I'm aware of, that kind of study, not similar things, but would have to have a similar setup that, um, yeah, that like they, they probably would have the pretense of it being for something else that doesn't actually ever happen. Right. All you psychologists out there, chime in. <laughs> We'd love to hear your thoughts. All right, so we have, um from Bruce, uh, he, he says, uh, Omaha, Nebraska, looking forward to seeing everyone's work. Uh, Joyce says hello from uh, Makilto, Washington. Um, let's see, uh, Art Deconstructed said, it's great, uh, referring to the Pallet and Chisel Club, says, open studio every day at Pallet and Chisel. Mary Chien, Lennon Del Sol paint there too. Mary will be at Portrait Society. We, a couple of us will too. Chelsea and I will be there. So, come over, we'll all, we'll all have a good conversation together. Yeah. Ben Gurley uh, says, are you guys working live now? And the answer is yes. Yes, we are live now, hence me reading your question live. Um, then we have, uh, see, Miriam is asking about being able to see the model. We don't have a camera on the model, but, uh, you can get pictures. Yes. Uh, well, also, I might even take the wide angle lens and, and make a shot so that they can, people can see um, the model as, you know, sort of like all of us while we're painting kind of shot. So uh, stay tuned on the next break and I'll see if I can switch things around. I'm, I'm so excited because I feel like I get to start with everyone this week, you know, which is great. You know, usually I feel like I'm panicking in the, on the side, trying to like get everything going. And I know I'm really glad that you're you're able to jump in with us. 
And I'll just start busting out in some Johnny Cash here in a second. <laughs> I don't want to start singing I Walk the Line and then like YouTube like flag it as like, hey, you're singing a <laughs> that, song. That would you know. be some impressive singing. <laughs> yeah, it would be, it? yeah. I'm hitting every note perfectly <laughs> where the algorithm picks up on me. <laughs> Tina Figarelli says, hello, everyone. Looking forward to the Portrait Society Conference and then a virtual hug. Tina. Nice. Nice to hear from you, Tina. Yeah, we're excited about seeing you. Um, that's another one of our uh, fellow Midwesterners up there. So um, can't wait. Glad you're coming uh, to, the, to the Portrait Society. Can't wait to hang out. So you can just be like, just go check me out at the bar. That's where I'll be. <laughs> Not really. Usually, I'm I'm usually out like on the balcony with some some friends at nighttime. I feel like you go to the Porsche Society, you go to learn, but really you just go to hang out after all the sessions. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's that's like the the most fun part of most any conference is is the relationships. I always got to catch myself. I, I, I try to talk instead of hum because I know that the humming is definitely not something people are like, I'm not tuning in to hear humming, you know? <laughs> <laughs> now you know exactly how, how I am in my own studio. Uh, Joyce asks, uh, or says, uh, remind me where to find the reference for today's session, please. Yes, yeah, so you should be able to go down in the show notes, like click below and expand the show notes of, of uh, YouTube. And there should be a link that allows for you to submit your email, and it will give you the reference images of all of the reference images from not only past, but all the way to present. So if you have gotten uh, reference images before, then you would have access to that link. Um, so, and you can just um, uh, try to find an old link to it. Then uh, Thelina says, great to see you all. 3.41 a.m. here in Sri Lanka. And if, if Lewis had told me that this was at 3.41 hour time, I wouldn't show up. So <laughs> props to you. <laughs> Well, we appreciate the loyalty because <laughs> that, is, that is some super loyalty right there. That's a super fan. Um, thank you so much for joining all the way from Sri Lanka. Yeah, I wonder if it's like they woke up or they yeah. just never went to sleep. Yeah. So let us know your personal habits of insomnia <laughs> if you have it. <laughs> but glad you do if that's why you're up. Um, if it means that you get to join and have a good time with us. It could also be people who have trouble sleeping put e stokes on to make themselves fall asleep. So, you know, like wa watching paint dry, I guess, you know. <laughs> Nicholas Thorpe, ladies and gentlemen, our former member of e Stokes Studio. <laughs> As of now. <laughs> you know, you always go in with all these like ambitions of like this masterpiece that you're going to create and then all of a sudden you start and you're like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I had such high hopes. Had some mood. <laughs> <laughs> I think every painter who has ever picked up a brush has had that moment of just like that blank canvas and going, oh, the possibilities. Yes. And then you start putting that brush to canvas and you start making decisions and you're like, this, I saw it going differently in my head. <laughs> Thank you. 
Lisa says, good evening, guys. This is such a treat. Oh, it's a treat to have you here. Everybody, let us know if, if you're going to be at Portrait Society next week. I'd love to see you. Also, if you're in the Scottsdale, Arizona area, um, I am teaching a workshop um, the first week of May. If anyone would like to come hang out or join the class, um, we'd love to see you. So we have a couple of spots left open for anyone who wants to join. And um, yet again, if you just want to come by and say hello. I love Scottsdale. What's that? I love Scottsdale. Scottsdale is a beautiful place. Yeah. I like, before COVID, I made it my mission to go every year and learn from somebody. Oh, really? That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Who are some of the people you learned from over there? Oh, Daniel Keyes and Daniel Keyes. And then Daniel Keyes again? <laughs> um, I'm trying to think if I... Oh, uh, Mark Did Bogus. you take his scholarship class? I did. Mm -hmm. awesome. Oh, actually, no. I'm too old for that particular one, but I got oh, a scholarship to okay. do, you know, the not super young up-and-comer one. Gotcha. Yes. Gotcha. The, the, the super exclusive. You know. Right. Yes. <laughs> Um, yeah, and then I did a plein air workshop with Mark Bogus, which was wonderful. That was the first one I did in Scottsdale. Oh, cool. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. Yeah, I freaking love it. I'm excited to go back at some point. Yeah, do you uh, have anything scheduled in the future, or are you just kind of like hanging out for now? Um, I'm going to go up to... Grand Rapids, Michigan, and take a workshop with um, Carol Anderson this summer. Oh, cool. Yeah. yeah. Excited to learn some more expressive painting techniques with her. That'll be fun. Yeah. I am excited about it. There's a question from Robert, and this is directed at Alex, so let's get Alex in the conversation. Uh, Robert says, Alex, what was the best advice or best thing you learned uh, that Odd Nerdrum gave you? Ooh. Oh, okay. Um, well, he, did, he didn't give me much advice, like, specifically to me. Um, he wasn't much of a teacher. It was more of kind of like... You could, you know, watch watch him paint, and he didn't talk much about technique, but more about kind of philosophy and stuff. Um, I'm trying to think. You know, it's not any one specific thing he he said, and I've I know I've said this before, but it's more of just me being able to watch him take a very kind of crude sketch and w the steps it took to take that little small sketch in a sketchbook that didn't really look like much and take it to like a, a life-size multi-figure painting and just everything involved in that. Just like seeing it actually happen sort of demystifies it a little bit. Yeah. So so much of that, I think that's a, the demystifying aspect of it. So much of being able to observe and see that it just can be done, that it wasn't like a magic wand that did it. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Actually really helps your confidence believe it's achievable, you know? Um, like I've told students in the past that like, you know, like the presence of the United States they did it in one lifetime. Like we think that, it, you know, they went to high school. Like they didn't go to like some special place and they went to high school. They did, you know, they went to an elementary school. They went to high school. They went to a college. And like they just took steps, but they achieved it in one lifetime. Like they achieved it all in, in just knowing relationships and seeing people. Sometimes it feels like these people like lived multiple lifetimes to get to where they are. And, and so, um, now, do they have advantages and all sorts of things? Well, I mean, that's a, diff that's a different conversation. But my point being is that, like, 
the things that happen, Rembrandt didn't live three lifetimes, you know, to get to where he was. He, he did it in one, so people were human. They made mistakes and they were bad at one point. Um, you know, all the masters were bad at painting at one point. Yeah, I really enjoy getting to dispel the myth that someone just comes out working this way. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right, you got 56 seconds. So everybody, we're going to, um, when the timer goes off, we're going to take a quick break, a uh, quick five minute break and put it on mute. I will relocate one of the angles so that we can, y'all can see the model and, uh, and sort of a wide angle for everybody. And Nick will every so often switch over to that angle so everyone can see. Um, and then uh, we will go, we'll kind of go from there. So, um, I said that hoping that like the timer would go off as soon as I got done saying that. <laughs> and now I feel like I'm just like, you know, just feeling, feeling the dead air until the timer finally just goes beep, 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 you know. Yep, just keep, keep going. Yeah, yep. <laughs> <laughs> Hurry up. <laughs> All right, everybody. Well, we are right at the end here. So, perfect, got it. We'll see y'all in just a bit. We'll see if that makes it better or worse. Yeah, it might make it worse, you know? So tell me if it does. If it does, I will most certainly take it away. I've had, I've had people at times, um, or models at times say, don't tell me when it's one minute left. Because it's kind of something about like seeing the finish line makes them sort of like, all of a sudden get extremely tired and it's like, you know. Um, so I have, I have learned my lesson for some people, love it, and some people, because they can wrap their mind around it, and some people, it's not a good thing. I love how her hair transitions into the background. It is the most beautiful color. It is, isn't it? Yeah. So silky. Just a little bit of a different color in the background this time around. This is me verbal, verbally processing like you do on Twitch, yeah. you know? Yep, yep. So if y'all all of a sudden start hearing me like, yes, yes, no, no, <laughs> stupid, stupid. You'll know what's going on. So we do have some comments from the audience. Uh, so uh, Thelina, who was the person uh, who I guess is watching at you know, th three in the morning, uh, says, yesterday Sri Lanka became a bankrupted country. We are here in the heart of Colombo uh, doing a protest now for, uh, for a few days against the government. So here I joined, uh, I, I joined uh, live. Thank you guys for, uh, for going live. Oh. Well, oh, hopefully we're a bit of a retreat for you in your mind yeah. with all the hardships you're going through. Um, heart goes out for all of our European friends during this sort of tough season. Uh, then we also have, uh, let's see, Sue asks, or no, just says, hi from the, uh, from the Plains, Virginia. Excited to be watching painting from Life Live, same time zone and same pollen. That's insane pollen. <laughs> nice. Yes. I'm so sorry. <laughs> yes, I, I apologize. 
that you have to be a part of that same pollen. Um, I hope your voice doesn't turn into Barry White too. All right, let's see. Uh, we also have Paul says, hi from Michigan. Love watching East Oaks Live. Oh, we love having you, man. Uh, and then uh, Thelina uh, at, or says, uh, what are the favorite paint brands of all, uh, uh, all you guys? I recently got a set of Rembrandt. Any thoughts in general? I don't want to be a brand endorsement. <laughs> <laughs> It was funny, one time we got accused for like branding endorsement just because we were talking about what we love. And oh, yeah. we have gotten, uh, uh, so full disclosure, we have gotten the, I've gotten this Edge Pro Gear um, from Edge as a donation uh, to me. I, I promote it because I love it. I had one before. They gave me this one, which is one of their newer models. So now that I've said that, <laughs> so I don't get in any trouble with anybody. Um, uh, as far as paint brands are concerned, I, I use a lot of Old Holland and Michael Harding as some of my main brands. Um, every now and again, I also use uh, natural pigments for my lead white and for a few of my colors, my vermilion. And they make excellent, excellent colors. Um, it just so happens that I uh, will make my way to Jerry's Artorama sometimes on a panic because I ran out of a color and they, they don't carry natural pigments. So, uh, but they do make excellent colors as well. All right, handing it over to you kids. Alex, I'm gonna defer to you. <laughs> um. Right now, I actually have a couple Rembrandt colors on my palette. The Transparent Oxide Red and Ultramarine Blue are both Rembrandt. I used to use them a lot. Now I kind of just use them when I'm sketching. But I, yeah, I mostly use Natural Pigments and Old Holland. And then I have a couple of colors that are Michael Harding. And then I have been using some sort of chromatic yellow from Rembrandt to lighten my shadows sometimes. But yeah, those are really the ones. So I, I let you go together because I knew you would have like very similar answers. <laughs> and mine is like <laughs> the complete opposite. Um, I am not particularly attached to any one brand. I have a lot of Rembrandt. I have a lot of Winsor Newton, um, a little bit of Gamblin. My white is Williamsburg and I have like one Michael Harding cadmium. I have like cad orange from Michael Harding. Um, I'm curious what attracts the two of you to the brands that you like. Cause I think for me, a lot of it comes down to, some of them are specific colors, like Winsor Newton Cad Yellow Pale is like necessary for a Zorn palette, in my opinion. It's a very specific, or did, what did I just say? I said Cad Yellow Pale, I meant Yellow Ochre Pale. Very necessary for like a Zorn palette. Um, mm. A lot of Yellow Ochre is like too dark. Mm. Um, but other than that, a lot of it just comes down to like the consistency. So I'm, I'm curious if that's sort of the same for you all or what your relationship is to that. Well, you should try the Rublev Blue Ridge Yellow Ochre. Cause I've used, I, I literally have Yellow Ochre, the Windsor Newton on my palette right now. And they're like the same color, but it's just a, in my opinion, better consistency and just more buttery and mm -hmm. I guess looks more professional to me when I see them like next to each other or I don't know. Interesting. I will have to try that. But it's probably more expensive. So it probably doesn't make that much of a difference. <laughs> probably looks the same when the painting's dry. 
Um, for, for me, uh, I think that if a color, it just starts working for me, I'll just stay with it, but I experiment a lot. And then once I've experimented and I've found things that just work, I kind of stop looking for that particular type of color. Yeah. Um, and so I just kind of stick with whatever it was, the brand, because I start getting used to how it paints and how it looks and, yeah. you know, how I can control it. So I think there becomes a certain time. I think you can paint with almost anything if you know how to, as long as it has good pure pigment in it. Um, yeah. I think some, some colors tend to go muddy really quickly if they're not really quality paint. But aside from like the, the filler aspect, I think that there's so much out there that you can use. Um, and it just becomes down to preference after a while. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like there's a, the oxide red that I use from Rublev is, I used to use this Rembrandt one all the time, but that one, I, I saw someone using it in a video and it was like just so much darker and richer Mm -hmm. And that's what I use it for is to make my rich darks. And that's like the only company that, that I've tried that makes it that dark. Yeah. And so, yeah, it's just those little things. What color was that? The transparent oxide yeah. red. I've, I've been needing to try their version of transparent oxide red because I use that so much on my palette that it'd be good to have a good a good one that does the exact same thing. I use it for making really dark colors. It's a great, great point. Do you all have kind of the traditional earth tones on your palette too? Like, do you have like a burnt sienna, burnt umber in addition to the transparent oxides? Um, the most neutral I have is a, is a raw umber and I use a raw sienna. Mm. And then um, <clears throat> my raw sienna is sort of my opaque ochre that I use in the lower scale of my uh, values. And then um, pretty much I use a, an ivory black as my sort of neutral blue. Gotcha. But um, I can mix any of those to get any more neutral that I need. So. Yeah, I, I used to use burnt sienna and then I replaced it with the transparent oxide red. So it's kind of, yeah. Yeah, really that's, that's definitely been my experience. And I was like, I had a feeling you all might use them. And I was curious how and why, but yeah, that, that makes total sense. So there is a question from Tina Figarelli who says, a question for all, what would you say was a turning point for your work, whether it be technique, mindset, etc.? I feel like mine was just getting to the skill level where I wouldn't get super self-conscious if I really messed up a painting anymore. Mm -hmm. Like at the point at which I could not have that inject a ton of imposter syndrome or self-doubt because I feel like that's when you can really start pushing yourself and trying things mm -hmm. when you're not constantly afraid of like oh man if I mess up this painting what does does that mean I'm like I just can't hack it or or whatever mm. yeah that's a good point I think it's super important that we we get to a point where we feel confident to fail, you know? Yeah, exactly. The, I think, um, I heard this recently and I've heard it before, but the reminder of it recently is kind of solidified it back in my head where Michael Jordan made 8,000 shots when it mattered, like when it was going to be like winning the goal, like winning the game, you know, game winning shots, you know, he actually attempted 28 thousand shots meaning that he missed 20 thousand of the shots you know and only made eight and there's another very similar statistic to like Babe Ruth how many times he struck out is just astronomical compared to the how many times he hit the home run and and so I think it's just so good for us to get to a point of realizing that failure is baked into success yeah 
and um, you know that realization is just incredibly, incredibly helpful. So, um, good. That was a good one. Thanks. Yeah. Good answer. Trying to bring my best to yeah. East Oaks. Bringing your A game, Chelsea. Right. Bringing your A game. <laughs> your body. Um. So, uh, speaking of, what was the question again? <laughs> What was, what was like an aha moment that we've had in our, our career? Uh, uh, the word that she used was turning point, but you know, I think a similar idea. A pivotal, a pivotal, pivotal moment. Um, I think a couple of things like hit home, like as far as technique is concerned, when I really understood how to think three-dimensionally and you could start seeing dimensionally, was just like, oh. Wow, like all of a sudden you see it go past the picture plane and you're like carving and sculpting in space versus like just putting something down. Um, that was a real sort of eureka moment for me um, and has really changed a lot of my, a lot of my uh, trajectory of my art making because um, it most certainly influences most of my art making um, to this day. So I would say that's a big one. Uh, for me, but the another one that's kind of similar to Chelsea's is that you get to a place where you feel like You know, there's so many times where if you mess up you're scared you get to you're you're in a state of being scared of not knowing how to get back on track But there's there's a time at which you get good at Understanding how to get yourself back on track and how to write the ship and that that is quintessentially helpful. Um, so, especially when you're like having friends and people critique with you and they're like, oh, I think you should do this thing. And you actually know what to do to do that thing that they're talking about, you know, um, yeah. versus it being like, okay, that's awesome. How do I do that? You know, and there's, there's a lot as a student that you, you feel that way. You feel like, I just don't know how I like I understand what they're saying but I don't know how to like actually do the thing that they're talking about yeah I remember in like a Daniel Keyes workshop he said that he didn't think the skill was in like making the loose painting it was in being able to take a painting too far get it too tight and then loosen it back up mm. and I've been like thinking about that ever since he said <laughs> it <laughs> it's kind of like tuning the guitar out of tune yeah and because it helps you get it back in tune yeah you know I would say, I had no idea what to say for a second, then there's this mind shift of kind of when you start a painting and it's all these big shapes and big forms and painting loosely and learning how to kind of, once you get that down, switching like this switch in your head like okay now it's zeroing in maybe go part by part and now it's time to kind of like switch from like big shape mode to small subtlety shape mm -hmm. mode and I feel like and there's times where I'm painting something that I think should be painted loosely like a shirt or something like that and I'm just repainting it over and over again because and then I'm like okay I need to stop and take a break and then come back and sort of zero and dot zero in and dial in on these mm. like small parts yeah I feel like what you said Louis really made me <clears throat> like that was like what unlocked that kind of thinking mm -hmm. that Alex was just talking about and I feel like that's still very much I'm in the middle of that happening mm -hmm. of like oh this has to be a soft edge or I have to paint this loosely because this is what the form is doing in space right yeah, yeah. there are so many times even in my career presently where I will be off track and visually I don't know what to do but logically I can Literally like a Sudoku go, okay, well, if this is going to be this, if this has to be that, and if that has to be this, then this has to be that. And then all of a sudden, you're starting to logically step your way out of it, and then all, to the point where you now can see it, and then you're like, oh, oh, now I see it. Now I can, like, you know, intuitively go. I love that. Know. 
yeah, I have this like weird sneaking suspicion that like for all we talk about the artistry of what we're doing, the more you learn about painting, <laughs> like mm. the more you feel like, oh, there's a correct answer to this versus like, I don't know, do whatever you want. Yeah, right. Yeah, which is weird. That's, I still feel weird thinking about that, but that's a different story. <laughs> So we have another question. We have a lot of questions, although it's, there is some in, in the comments of just people asking if they might know each other or whatever, so, which, which is uh, quite, quite cool to see. But uh, Lisa says, do you think each person has a limit of capability no matter how long and how hard one works? Ooh, that's like, I think everyone's fear. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that you need to shut that voice up. Yeah. I think that sometimes if we're asking that question, you're searching for the wrong answer. Yeah. Um, because all of us to a certain, some certain degree are limited. And the reason we do what we do is because we, we love the process. And so I think that, that keeping a healthy mind sometimes, because you can always get in your head that somebody's better than than you or they have this the tool set now what i would say is is that i have met people who learn quickly something a lot faster than someone else and i think that there is a certain version of like you know neuroplasticity and all the things of like learning however i have met some people that can learn really well but have a tenacious spirit and get much further in their career at, with with tenacity than they ever would just being gifted at learning that thing really well. Um, yeah. So sort of a tortoise and a hare. Um, I think tenacity is actually typically what gets you there faster than uh, a lot of things. So keep that in mind uh, and we will be back. I would love to hear everybody else's comments on the same uh, scenario and uh, we'll be back in about five minutes. Yep, let's do it. This is Vanessa's first time modeling and she's doing a fantastic job. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, I want a reminder of the last question because it was a really good one. It was a good one. What was, I can't remember what it was now because I was I know. something. Uh, Nicholas. Uh, the question. question was, do you think each person has a limit of capability no matter how long and how hard one works? Yeah, I feel like I really agree with what Louis said, and I, I want to underscore it because I, I do feel like there are things that will hold you back, and I feel like it is primarily to do with your mindset and, and how you approach your work in the studio and whether or not that's like one of curiosity and continuing to be really excited about it even on days where it gets, kicks your butt and it's hard and frustrating and believing like yeah I did not nail this today but you know what one day I will and I feel like that's what lets people keep painting long enough to get really good and I feel like that's the really important thing is like are you going to have the mindset that sustains you for painting for a really long time because I don't know anyone who didn't have to paint for a really long time to get mastery in their craft. Um, also, to add to it, with the one thing I would like to say is that the other way to think about it is all of us are limited. The, the, literally, the medium we choose is limited. We can't make a three-dimensional thing on this, on this space. So note that the only way we're actually able to create poetry is through limitation and pushing the limitation to their edges. So you pushing your limitations 
as far as you can is what your goal should be, not necessarily thinking that you're limited, you know. So it's almost kind of like, you know, the reason a haiku can be so beautiful is because so many people have said such profound things through just a few syllables. And the same thing applies to painting, sculpture, music, narrative, story, movies, is that you're trying to limit your ability to do something and be creative within the limitation to be able to have somebody tap into a particular emotional uh, state of who they are when they see something as a viewer that might be able to relate to something that they're feeling. And um, if that's your goal, then, then none of us are. Uh, all of us are limited, and yet because of that, none of us are. Luz, is your mic on? I, I, we can no! Hear it. It's just, well, they, they could hear it, but it was just kind of weird. Well, there was like a mic drop moment there, you know, and then I, uh, <laughs> no one heard exactly what I said. But. <laughs> it was great. That, all, all in all to be said is that we're all limited. We're all um, have limited in what we can do, and so is the medium we use and where you actually operate and create and try to be creative within the limitations we're given. And because of that, uh, all of us are and yet none of us are. And so asking ourselves if we're more limited than other people is not the right question, but to say how can we be creative within the limitations we're given. So. That's a good recap. <laughs> so there, I always think about the guy on my big fat Greek wedding, the father, and after he'd finished saying something and relating it to back to the Greeks, he'd always be like, yeah, so there you go. <laughs> That's how I feel like, I'd be like, so there you go. Tina Figarelli says, I hope everyone in the chat is having a great day. It's really rainy here in Chicago. Oh, man. I feel like we've had a lot of rainy weather this year. Yeah. Um, compared to springs in the past. I'm not complaining. It's good for the farmers. <laughs> but um, I will say, you have to come, um, come down, Tina. The, the, the weather's fine here right now. So. Feels pretty good. It's like one of the interesting things about spring of 2020, like because no one was driving and everyone was like not leaving their houses at all, the weather for like mm. April and May was mm -hmm. so beautiful. Yeah. Another question from the audience. Uh, Lakshan says, hi guys, I have a question. I face difficulties when the oil paint surface looks uh, unevenly glossy after a few days. Some areas are glossy, some areas of the painting looks absorbed and dried. I know that problem well. Um, I've experienced that many times in my own paintings. Um, typically, I, I wouldn't, you know, the. I would say the, the quick answer to that is, is you can oil it out with like something like oil, oleo gel or do a thing when you're about to paint an area, do a thing called couching, which is adding a little bit of pigment to the oil so that it, it doesn't yellow your painting too poorly. Um, I wouldn't oil it out every time you see the issue unless you're actually going to need it for context um, due to the fact that it can yellow your painting by doing too much oil too many times in an area. Um, but a common occurrence when you're using some colors that don't sink in nearly as much as other colors. Uh, would anyone else like to chime in or add to? Well, yeah, it's just a, it's a problem we all have and just have to like strategically oil out the parts that you need to see 
for the part that you're working on. And try not to do it too much and just yeah, balance it. But oh yeah, is that a problem? Everybody's concentrating heavily. <laughs> Another question is, is uh, what colors would mix uh, would you mix for her silver hair without making it gray slash blue when mixing titanium white and ivory black? I would absolutely make her hair blue. Yeah. I see a lot of blue in her hair. <laughs> That's exactly what I was thinking. I was yeah, like, I've already too. added a ton of blue. If you notice, yeah. I even have like a blue mixture over here yeah. that I've added into her hair. The reason I say do that is also because she has such a cool color in her hair. In order for the skin to look warm, because there's like a beautiful contrast between her fair sort of pinkish skin to that to the hair that you need to shift the the hair as cool as you can without it without it feeling just incredibly blue, so that you actually create that rich like pink fairness in her skin. Yeah, it's like you're talking about the limitations. So working within that limitation to make the skin feel one way, gotta make this hair more blue. Cause yeah, I was trying to mix it neutral and I was like, nope, it needs pure blue in there. Mm -hmm. And in some places I needed like a touch of lavender. Particularly, you all have a different view f from me, but where her mm. hair transitions into the gray of, oh, not the uh -huh. backdrop, but yep. the gray of the yep. rest the of the of room, the yep. it interacts and it becomes very, very blue for me um, in a way that's a little bit different from, from what you all are painting, I imagine. Mm -hmm. But I feel like a lot of that bounces in too, so it is a little bit situational. I mean, you get people that are sort of colorists and that they'll push the warm and cools as far as they can. And as long as you, you balance it with the counteracting chromatic in the warm, it can actually help create a very beautiful harmonious balance. And it's, it's all about trying to create good balance. You can go super chroma on both sides if you know how to balance them properly. Um, So I think a lot of people get to this idea of, oh, I can't be very chromatic, or I, oh, I can't be, um, you know, like super neutral and tonal, you know, and honestly, you can either do both. It's really how do you want to paint and then learn how to paint in that, in that context. Because yeah. I've seen so many people do it so successfully. Uh, Tina, in response to the comments uh, about coming down here, uh, she says, I'm worried about the allergies down south. Perhaps I should bring my aller allergy pills to Georgia. Zyzol can do wonders, let me just say. <laughs> um, it, it get, I only have allergies right now, and, and it, gets, it gets way better in about... I have allergies for about four weeks out of four or five weeks out of the year, and then the rest of the year it's great. But it's funny, I've never had allergies until I moved to North Carolina. Yeah, I know a lot of people for whom that is true. Do you have any allergies, Chelsea? Um, I actually found out that I did after thinking that I didn't have any which is apparently kind of common. You can have things that are just below the threshold of like what you actively notice. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it turns out I'm kind of a little bit allergic to a lot. <laughs> really? But I just never have go. like a strong reaction in the spring yeah. or, you know, the reaction I do have isn't like being sniffly or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I'm like doing okay right now which I am very grateful for, but also it's always like a, a little bit of a pain. Yeah. yeah. I hear you. Uh, 
uh, Tina asks, what size Edge Pro gear is that, by the way? I was looking on their website and saw different sizes, but wasn't sure. Um, mine is the standard size. I don't know. I know that they have like a plain air small size version, but um, I know that mine mine is, is, is um, the normal size. They might have had a new bigger size. Have y'all seen if they've had a bigger size or not? Last I looked, there was the, the paint book, and then there was the smaller one, whose name I can't remember. And I assume if it's the same yours as the paint book, but I haven't actually looked in a long time. I know that there is a Josh LaRock signature one oh. these days. Or my old buddy Josh. Josh is a co-founder of East Oak Studio. Um, so he's got himself a signature version these days. But I think it's the same size. I think it's just a color thing on that one. All right, Sam says, hi from North Carolina. Uh, and Sue asks, uh, do you tend to use transparent oxide red instead of alizarin crimson to make your darks? Ooh, I use both. Um, but I would say if I'm making like uh, trying to make a neutral, ultramarine blue and oxide uh, and, and um, oxide red do a fantastic job going fully neutral if you needed it to. So, um, so that's kind of a go-to when that happens. Yeah, my alizarin crimson replacement is um, permanent rose because the new like permanent alizarin is, my understanding is it's just a variation on permanent rose and permanent rose is a little bit more chromatic and I'd rather have something a little bit more versatile. Um, so I do not have alizarin crimson on my palette at all. Yeah, permanent rose is a, a beautiful color, though. Yeah, for a while I like waffled on whether permanent magenta or permanent rose were the true primary, and I don't think either one's perfect. But after a while, I realized like permanent rose was doing just fine. I'm stuck with that. And at the end of the day, you know. So much of our paintings come down to sort of a form of tonal harmony. That it doesn't matter that we are able to mix every color of the rainbow. Um, but great to have it if you wanted that control. Yeah. Yeah, it kind of blew my mind when I learned that like we can't mix every color. Like doesn't matter what your palette is. Like there are some colors mm -hmm. that are just like, yep, good luck. Yep. And you, you have to like shift the hue or shift the chroma or do something to compensate. Another thing that like blows my mind is if you look at like the three dimensional form of, of color, like as a color wheel for, um, oh my gosh, why am I drawing a blank on the guy's name with the- Munzel. Munzel, yeah. Mm. And, um, you look at like the Munsell three-dimensional form and how many colors say like in blue that hadn't even been discovered. Like we don't even yeah. know what they look like. They just don't exist, but they exist in red and yellow, you yeah. know? Um, it makes you kind of have a whole new understanding and appreciation for like what color is, could be, you know, and, and its limitations. Lisa has asked a follow-up question. Uh, which brand of Permanent Rose? Uh, I have Windsor Newton Permanent Rose. Lord Snooty, which I imagine is not their Christian name. Uh, Lord Snooty. Uh, asks, uh, I'm really struggling with getting color values right. Is there anything you did uh, to help the pain in getting them right? Getting color values right? Uh, uh, color, color values. values. 
Um, well, I mean, I'd say practice in black and white or, tone, um, you know, creating a grisaille um, beforehand. That will help you take out all the other hue and chroma formats and then allow for you to be able to, like, see much better um, what what you need to do for as far as mixing your value when you put add color and chroma to it. That could that could be helpful. Does anybody else have um sometimes I just start like getting scared and fill dead space. So like making <laughs> sure that y'all have opportunity to I mean that's that's exactly in. what I have my students do. Anytime they think that it's something that's only happening in color, I'm like that's happening to some degree in black and white. Yep. Um and I think the best thing you can do to develop a skill is, at least in the beginning, is to like isolate the variable that is that skill. So, you know, if you're if you're working in color and you think you're focusing on value, you're still generally trying to mix the right color, and your attention's a little bit divided. Mm. So I would typically encourage a painter to like go back and just isolate that value variable, um, and potentially also give them themselves permission to like not worry as much about edges or not worry as much about drawing yeah. if that is the focus of that painting. Right. Figurative artist Benjamin Lester uh, says, uh, tell me about a painting nightmare you experienced and what you learned from it. I don't know if this is, I assume like an actual, uh, you know, just something that went wrong, but I am kind of curious if anybody has had a nightmare about painting as well. <laughs> That's me tossing in my question too. I'm sure I've had a painting nightmare somewhere in there. <laughs> Deadline coming up. I feel like most of mine are from like not choosing an appropriate reference and realizing way too late. Me too. Yeah. What was it again? Not choosing an appropriate reference and only realizing when the painting is almost finished and oh, it's yeah. too late. Yeah. 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 That that is that is a, a nightmare. Sometimes working with bad reference images is really brutal. All right, everybody, we're going to take a quick break. Um, let the model rest rest for a bit, and we will be back shortly. Yeah, okay. we, were carrying, we were carrying on, <laughs> now we're on camera. I always feel like when I get back that there's that one thing that I needed to get on break, but then I forgot while it was break time. <laughs> And then I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, I, I, oh, next time. I try and tell myself I'm not allowed to paint during break. I don't know to what effect though. So back to the uh, painting nightmares. Did anyone confess? <laughs> Can anyone go into more detail? Uh, I, I, I don't actually recall any painting nightmares, but um, painting nightmares in the sense of like bad things, fiescos. Um, I don't know if you'd put this in the category of painting nightmare, but workshop nightmare. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was teaching a workshop and I was doing the lecture part and I realized it was, it was so boring that somebody had a heart attack. Oh during, no. <laughs> literally. Oh. Um, and I was I like think that talking. Means it was so exciting. Someone had that's, a heart attack. That's what we're gonna go with. Yeah, I like that version. Yeah. Um, Zorn workshop would go. <laughs> yeah. So I'm sitting there teaching, and and luckily they were fine. Everybody was okay. Um, the ambulance came and checked her out, and everything was okay. But um, quite scary and quite a nightmare at the moment. Yeah. So. Yes. Where did that happen in the movie? That happened in
University of Atlanta, um, I was teaching a workshop for them, and it most certainly happened um, at the workshop. What, did it feel like one of those moments where, like, you weren't sure what was going on for, like, a few seconds kind of thing? Uh-huh. Well, yeah. I mean, the, the really fearful part was you're, you're scared that, you know, that she, she might have passed, and you, that would be a really bad day, you know. But, um, no, luckily she, it looked like she had fainted, and she had hit the floor. And we had two physicians in our group, and so that was helpful. But um, yeah. makes for a great story, especially since it turned out okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's not one I'd be telling a lot if, if, um, if it had turned south. Yeah. Okay. So Christine Long says, Lewis asked about our, our heart moments. Mine was understanding how to apply the techniques of aerial perspective to the painting of portraits and still life rather than just landscapes. Oh, giving some atmosphere. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, Bruce says, does size matter? What size is your average painting? <laughs> And I feel like that was a, that was a charged question there. <laughs> size of the brush does not matter. And what what does what do, what does size matter? What size is your, what size is your average painting? And is there any correlation to sizes and level of markets or gallery success? Meaning, do galleries prefer larger paintings over small? Ooh, that is a yeah. really good question. Um, all right, so my, my gallery experience literally is, is more limited because I do a lot pr privately. But I do believe that in my experience of knowing many, many people in galleries, and Alex can probably lean in more on this, and probably you can too, Chelsea, but that smaller works are take up less real estate on their wall and are a little bit more in a price range that hits a larger demographic. So because of that, um, I do believe galleries often, unless the gallery has a collector base that is... Um, much more affluent, um, I do believe that, that they tend to do better. Um, so, Alex and Chelsea, take it away. Alex, I wanna hear your thoughts on this. Yeah, um, yeah, the, I would say like from small to medium, it's, if the painting, if the painting is good, it's you know, it's probably gonna sell. But what, there's definitely a range when it's too big, that makes it a lot harder to sell because the bigger it's not the way that like paintings are priced in galleries and stuff. It's like yeah, if it's bigger, it costs more. So I usually don't have a problem with like small to medium, but then once. It hits a certain price range. Oh, do, you, yeah. do you want to share some specifics on those sizes and price ranges? <laughs> I could. I, I would be curious to hear. So, ask, ask a specific. Give me a size uh, or something. Okay, okay. <laughs> so what, would, what is the threshold of like, this is large enough that it would be tricky to sell? Probably like a bit over 24 by 36. Okay. In my, like what my price range is now. Mm -hmm. So you think it's a little bit more tied into price than size necessarily? Yes. Y you want and to share what price that would be? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let me think. Well, I think it's like the closer that, 
is where it starts to get near 20,000. Mm -hmm. And that there up is where it starts to get harder. Gotcha. To sell. Um, but then, yeah, I'm sure there's a size thing if you're someone who does really large work where people just have nowhere to put it. Yeah. It's interesting because I assume if you are an abstract painter, like this conversation is entirely different where people want things to put over their sofa or, mm. you know, over the mantle or whatever. And typically like abstract work will be priced differently. Yeah, so. that's interesting. That's a good thought. Uh, a question from Christine Long. What do you guys do with your portraits done on these sessions after the session is done? That is a great question. Um, so, East Oaks likes to put these out for these, these um, YouTube videos for free with no advertising on them. Um, and we pay for the models and all, all of those things. And so, in turn, we do offer these um, demos as an opportunity to purchase um, through East Oaks so that East Oaks can um, support, or it goes 100% it goes to supporting East Oaks. Now, it also goes to, to a portion, uh, the larger portion of it goes to the artist as well to support the artist. So, um, so if if the artist decides to to uh, do it, I one hundred percent of mine goes towards East Oaks. So, um, but yes, all of them typically uh, in the past have gone up for sale for for that reason. Good question. So Alex, just a question. Um, with the workshop that you just taught um, at East Oaks um, and like your approach then, like the step-by-step -step thing and versus like how you're approaching it now, what's like, yeah, the difference and like how you're thinking differently? Hmm. Yeah, the, I mean, the main, one of the main things is just spending way less time on drawing. You can see I even got rid of most of my drawing. Um, whereas in, in the video, I spend time to like draw it out precisely or you know as precise as I can get it. Um, and then it's also a, like, I'm thinking about a like, general block in layer and then letting that dry and then doing kind of smaller shapes and then working into the block in. So it's sort of a two layer method, whereas this I'm just going for everything all at once. But I mean, a lot of brushwork things and edges and stuff, I'm, a, I'm attempting it now. Um, but just a lot more loose. So, um, Sam Mc McLemore says, do you do commissions? So I feel, Louis, this one is a good one for you. And if you do, how long does it take? Do you wait till the painting is dry after months to varnish? And do clients ever have issues with waiting so long? Okay, what was the first part of that question? Do you do commissions? Okay, yes, um, I'm mainly a commission painter um, at the moment. Uh, I would enjoy to have a branch of, of myself to do more gallery work, but right now I have so many commissions on order that I have to kind of crank through those before I can um, put myself on on the market in any other way. Um, the second part of that question, which is uh, varnishing, and um, we'll start with varnishing. So 
Yes, I do. I am on, I just want to double check. I am off mute, right? Let me just double check because I don't want to like go through all of this. Okay. <laughs> all right. So um, I, I do put a retouch varnish on it once I've given it to them. I let it dry for at least two weeks and then I put a retouch varnish on it. Then um, after that, I put, um, I do a later, I, a year later, typically I go back to those areas to do other commissions. And so when I do that, I usually call those other clients back up and say, hey, I'll come by and I'll put on the final varnish on your painting. And I use Conservar um, as my varnish that I use uh, with natural pigments. So um, it is the same kind of varnish that a lot of museum restoration um, craftsmen use uh, for their work. So it's a really high quality varnish. And I like it better than Gamvar because the tensile strength of, I mean not the tensile strength, the um, surface tension of, of it is uh, less than Gamvar. So what happens with Gamvar sometimes is it beads up and especially if you paint uh, really softly or thinly and so because of that, um, I try to um, steer clear of it. Will you, because Gamvar requires a weaker solvent than Conservar, do you remove the Gamvar first or do you go ahead and put Conservar on top of it? Well, I don't use Gamvar in the first layer. I use retouch varnish. Oh, okay. um, However, um, you most certainly can use Gamvar on top of um, Conservar. And they, uh, George O'Hanlon, who owns Natural Pigments, actually recommends, he has a equivalent version, the same chemical mm -hmm. compound as Gamvar. And he recommends doing it on the top because then that is a sacrificial layer to the under layer that only requires a, a lighter solvent to remove it. Yeah. So in 10 years, you can remove that layer and then, um, and then go back and, and put another one on, and then you don't have to touch the, the varnish underneath it for like 30 years or yeah. 50 years or something. Your varnishing video is like the best, by the way. I oh, people, thank you. Yeah, I have people ask me about varnish all the time. I'm like, I have a little YouTube video about it, but if you want the lowdown, go watch the East Oaks one. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you, Chelsea. You sweet of you. Welcome. Send, them, send them this way. I need to, I need, I'm, intend to want to get back into uh, creating more of those videos because I think that they're so helpful for people. Yeah. And it also helps me do the research too, you know, to make sure that I know <laughs> what I'm talking about. So Lisa Zakur says, any advice on pricing small to medium paintings if you are not known? I have an answer for this. Do it. Okay. Oh, look, anytime you have an answer and I can paint, too, you know, I'm cool with it. <laughs> I know, but I, I want to, I feel like Alex is like perfectly content to let me like take up space and talk, but. I am, I, look, I, I talk far too much and usually it's because I get nervous when there's dead air. So, um, you're, anytime you want to jump in and okay. go right away. All right. So my answer to this would be first, know your market. So I do market research, see what pieces sell for from artists who are also emerging in your market. And whatever your market is, is highly variable. That market could be your like local art scene. It could be the art fair you're going to. It could be the gallery you're showing at. It could be the whole internet. Like, but whatever, however you are presenting the work, you will want to price it based on what the market has proven around you. Um, and what I've heard from like gallery owners and other people talking about pricing is like you typically want to be in the middle of that market. And that also helps you determine like what's an appropriate place for this work to exist in. Um, and then to what Alex was saying before, you will generally want to price based on size. So like price per square inch typically for realist painters. And you might tier that pricing based on 
the size of the piece. So you might have a certain price per square inch up until a certain size. And then that price per square inch might go down as you get bigger and bigger. So that doesn't get like exponentially ridiculous um, in terms of your pricing model. And it's important for that pricing to be consistent and for you not to say like, oh, well, this painting sucks, so I'm going to price it for less. Or this painting is super good, so I'm going to make it super expensive. If the painting sucks, don't try to sell it at all. Exactly. Exactly. It shouldn't be in your portfolio if you don't feel comfortable pricing it accordingly to other things that you are selling. Uh, yeah, I think that's my Reader's Digest version of pricing it. your work for emerging artists. Yeah, it's funny. I remember like when I was first deciding I wanted to sell work, I'd be looking wherever I could to see what other people's prices were that I thought were around my skill level. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's such a good answer. Thank you. Yeah, that was awesome. And, and, uh... Bruce says, thank you for the pricing discussion. This is very missed in workshops and other forums. Happy to help. Jesse, maybe we'll have like a, a good a, a video day where we can we can do just that and make a little video on it. I would be happy to be a part of that. Oh yeah, that would be cool. And um, so Sue Braswell says, my husband gave me two East Oaks live session paintings for Christmas. Thank you for making them available. I love them. Oh, that's Aww. awesome. Yeah, it's awesome. our honor. We're happy that you've invited us into your, into your home. Uh, Louis, someone was asking uh, how we, uh, Andy W was asking how he would buy one of these. Did you answer that before? Did you cover that? Yeah, before? email. Uh, info at eastoakstudio.com and um, inqui inquiring about it before we post because what we'll do is we'll put out an email blast about it. But if you want to be the first to inquire, just email us at info at eastoakstudio.com and we will um, respond to you accordingly as soon as we have a chance to. So Chelsea, are you going to um, Portrait Society next I, week? I am and I'm devastated stated that you and Alex won't be there. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, <it laughs> but I'm really fun. looking forward to it. It'll be my first one. Oh, really? It's yeah. your first one? Yeah. Well, that's going to be awesome. Yeah, that, I felt like you'd been involved. Like... You'll be like, my people. <laughs> yeah. Okay, everybody, we're going to take a quick break. Okay, cool. Speaking of Porch Society, Chelsea, are you more of a, on the introverted scale or? or... I feel like it's changed during COVID. Like mm -hmm. it's made me really prioritize like meaningful social interaction. Mm -hmm. So I'm like a total hermit, but I think I can come off as kind of extroverted. Gotcha. You're an um, introvert extrovert. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I do anticipate being very tired talking to a lot of people I don't know well yet. Um, so Michael Klein, when we would go, you know, he'd be my roommate um, often. And um, I'm, if you, <laughs> if you haven't noticed, extreme extrovert. <laughs> and, um, and so I'd be around people just like, like a vampire sucking <laughs> energy out of everyone. And, and uh, he'd, he'd look at me and be like, <sighs> it'd be like one in the afternoon, he goes, and going back to the room, taking out, <laughs> you know, because he's exactly the opposite of me. Such an introvert. Um, I'd be like, okay, have fun, and I would just be like, charged till like <laughs> one or two in the morning talking to people, and then like as soon as I leave people, it's like I've taken the plug out of the outlet, mm -hmm. and like all of a sudden I realize how exhausted I am. Yeah. So. I notice I get like a headache from smiling and trying to look happy in front of people. Or not trying, but yep. just like yep. using my face in a really engaged I'll way. Just, oh, so and so's coming. I'll try to be happy. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, oftentimes I come away from that with like a weird tension headache, which is not how I feel about it. 
No, I get it. I hear you. Yeah, I, I get that when, like, something has to be perfect. I'm like, this has to be a perfect experience. <laughs> and then I get, yeah, I get that too, actually. I'm glad I'm not alone. <laughs> um, so what are you most looking forward to with, like, Portrait Society? Is there, like, a particular painter or, like, something specific? I have a lot of artist friends that I've gotten to know online during the pandemic um, who will be there and this is going to be the first time I actually get to meet a lot of them in person um, and I am so excited about that and that will it's, be fun. Yeah, and it's, it's so energizing for me to come and paint with you all and we're going to set up and paint anytime there's like an available model just hanging out mm -hmm. um and so i'm excited for the paintings that'll come out of that and that's another thing is i'm not um sure I, kim seemed to tell me um that something about the hotel is gonna mm -hmm. be like really watching because they don't want people doing that that much i was but, told the same thing yeah um so I was like, oh, drat. But I'm bringing everything just in case. Yep, exactly. <laughs> you know, find a little corner somewhere and be like, quick, yep. set up or do a figure model. Go ahead, yep. take your clothes off, get over the thing. <laughs> All of a sudden, they come around the corner. There's somebody modeling nude <laughs> in the hallway. OK, I was oh. thinking like a, an impromptu portrait, but no, sure, I was, sure. I'm trying to be funny. <laughs> So this is uh, called Portrait Society of America. And so for people who are figurative artists and portrait painters, um, it's, it's sort of our moment of the year to gather. So there's, there's several conferences that are, are quite popular. One of them is Oil Painters of America and kind of all the conferences are roughly around this time period. And um, another one is, is um, are they still doing the um, track oh. track and um, figurativus um, ones? Is track know. is track still going? Is he I have no idea. Um, there's also another one for landscape painters called Plain Air Convention, that's that's very popular. So um, I, I would say for portrait painters, it's sort of like our version of the of like a, a weekend conference at the Oscars for us mm -hmm. because they also. You, there's also a huge international competition, and you enter, and um, you know if you win, you're you're recognized, and all of that stuff. So, um, so a lot of people come from all over the place. Some, a few from around the world, um, but there's other places in the world that have some stuff that's similar. So, I would say BP Portrait Awards is one of the bigger ones in London um, that's known, but. It's just like any field, you can dive really deep into whatever profession and find a community, and that's one of ours. And Louis, what's something you're specifically looking forward to going this time? I mean, I, I just love people and love getting to talk to people and what they're doing. I mean, that's just always one of my, my favorite parts. This is my first year as faculty, so uh, teaching and serving um, and, and doing my workshop is going to be a lot of fun. I'm also critiquing portfolios. And, um, and so I'm going to be, I'm going to be quite busy, um, during the whole thing because there's a lot of people that I want to like connect to and help, you know, there's a few people have reached out to me that I know that have said, this will be my first time and I'm scared and I don't know who to talk to and want to help them find the people that I think that would be helpful for them to know, that kind of thing. So, well, Portrait Society is quite a synchronistic time because that's where, Alex, you met, like, Louis and Michael, oh, right. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Alex met us. We already knew that he was coming, and we had already kind of, like, connected virtually, but that was the first time that we, I think, we connected um, yeah, I already knew, I already met Michael, but it's the first time meeting Louie and Josh. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's right, you took Michael's workshop years earlier. 
Mm -hmm. And he was being super vague about there might be some opportunity that we, you know, I'll give you a call sometime and it like months would go by. And then I'm like, okay, they're all going to Portrait Society. I have to find them. <laughs> That's awesome. Alex, wasn't there like a moment where you were going to leave and you're like, no, I'll go, you had a feeling that you should go back in and then they would like something like that? And I didn't know anybody. So I really wasn't the type that was going to go chill at a bar by myself. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. Just see Alex out there <laughs> spreading the vibe on the, at the bars <laughs> and sitting at the bar. I love that. Yeah, so I went back to my car and then was like, you know, don't be a pussy, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> Get back in there and act <laughs> like you were going in for a reason, you know, whatever. <laughs> and then as I was walking back for no reason, I ran into you guys and you're like, yeah, we're grabbing food. You want to come with? <laughs> oh, that's awesome. I did, I, th this is the first I've heard this. Really? Yeah, I've never heard this story. Yep, that's what. And I, yeah, I always you, say, Alex had a feeling to go back, and that was, you know. And the rest is history. <laughs> I even chose Michael as my like, because he was doing the critiques. Oh, uh huh. I knew that because I remember Michael or you saying that like he was like, you know, find your own voice. Don't paint like other painters kind of thing oh yeah at the critique boy yeah, you took that to heart that. and he uh he also didn't know that i chose him you know you can like choose oh, or you can choose a random uh-huh and then like i chose him but he was like you know you can choose someone else if you want because that's so a michael like, thing to say <laughs> already taken his workshop and know him and he's given me Critique before I'm like, no, I want to know about this opportunity. <laughs> You're gonna tell me. You were saying something about a, an opportunity. Someone said, I've gone several times, lots of fun, you will enjoy it. The first main night when they have a paint off is really exciting to watch. Yeah, that is Ooh. fun. Thank you. The, the paint off is so great because it's super chill and everybody's kind of mingling and chatting it up, but then you can kind of go over and watch the painters paint, you know, um, but it's that I think honestly that's one of their best things that they've ever done at um, Portrait Society, as far as like initial let's hang out thing. Yeah. Some of my friends who will be there the other night just to have fun and like unwind did a left-handed painting competition where they both got nice. the same portrait reference and we're just kind of hanging out and <laughs> like goofing off and like letting painting just kind of be this like silly joyful thing I love that i have a feeling that the group of us are probably going to have something like that while we're while we're there well that's actually something i want to do with with um these nights is to do something limitation oh. so like like one of them be where you only you can only paint with one brush and we draw straws for what brush it's going to be. Oh, man. And then, like, one of them be, like, left-handed painting sounds like a great one. Or a limited palette, and we mm -hmm. have, like, three different colors. Yeah. And yet again, you have to draw straws for the colors. Yeah. Um, but I think it would be a lot of fun. I think everybody else who's listening, put your feedback in if that's something you would like to watch. Um, all of us do sort of challenges. Uh, like fun, like Iron Chef style, sort of style challenges. I feel like it would be important that it be a little bit silly. I feel like we can't. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, 
the same person said mystery cell is also great at portrait society and the same person said yes to challenges. Yes to challenges. Cool. We got one yes vote. Alex, we have your vote. <laughs> <laughs> Alex is being very quiet over there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to think if I were being really mean, what what three colors? I feel like Oof, you, yeah, I feel like I would really try and screw someone over on the values of the colors I handed them. You know, like just nothing even remotely close to titanium white. Mm -hmm. Just like okay, you got phthalo blue. <laughs> uh, what's what's another obnoxious one? Hmm. Or maybe even like where you do all different greens, but they all oh, are different like yeah. like hues or warm and cool versions. Yes. You know. I love um, it. That's terrible. That's that's heinous yeah. and <laughs> diabolical and I love it. Please don't give that to me. <laughs> You're like, I love it as long as I'm not here. <laughs> Although I feel like when you're doing something impossible, it's easier just to be silly. And I feel like we're not silly enough as like classical or realist painters. Yeah, that's true. Uh, that's the, uh, that's uh, one of the hard parts of, of being uh, in this field is that, you know, anyone who knows me is, is that I'm kind of, a, kind of a goofy, kind of a fun, I, I like to have fun and be goofy sometimes yeah. kind of guy, but I'm in a field where everyone is very serious <laughs> yeah. all the time. And so like to find the people that are like, hey, you know, let, let's just lighten the mood just a little bit, you know, and they're like, no, drama, <laughs> art, you know. and Classical so, like, music. Yes. So, um, so anyway, I, I try to find ways that we can all have a good time. So our question from um, Ariel Saint, Alex, how many years did it take you to get to the level that you have now? Um, well, I've been doing it, I think it's like 10 years now. Because graduated high school in 2012, and then I went to art school. So I started doing some oil paintings there, but then dropped out, and then really started. So it was kind of, yeah, 2012, 2013. And I had, I was doing stuff before then that was very kind of surreal and, you know, strange or weird. And the, the accuracy and color and value and all that didn't matter as much, but I still worked on it to a degree that got it to a certain skill level. But, I don't know, I'd say 10 years. Um, and then the same person says, do you have any inconveniences in regards consistency in practice due to having to do an, another, sorry, due to doing another job, I think that due to having to do another job in between or financial issues to study classical realism? Well, I used, I used to work other jobs before, before it started to work out. Um, and then I would also try and find, like when I did uh, a still life competition at Grand Central Atelier, that won me a nice chunk of money that allowed me to kind of paint for a while without 
you know, selling any. But yeah, what I'm I'm blanking on what the first part of the question was. Mm, uh, no, did you have any inconveniences? Because um, I'm not allowing you to like practice, kind of mm. thing. Because you had financial issues or jobs. Yeah. Yeah, that. I think is about yeah, the balance of trying to keep your your cost of living low enough that you can that you can have yeah a second have a job and also paint and yeah all the stuff. But it luckily enough it worked out for me at a good at a good time. Mm. But if I had to, I would get another job. I, um, I think that it'd be good for both of, all three of us to enter, yeah. enter into that conversation too, because I think that Alex is a situation that's slightly more of an anomaly. You know, for me that, um, I I started my portrait career when I was thirteen, and it took me till I was twenty one to have or twenty to have enough work where I could be full-time. And I bartended, I started my own other company uh, at, at uh, the school that I went, went to college. Um, and doing all of those things helped me make ends meet while I was trying to pursue my passion. Um, and it was worth it. And I'd say most, most artists have a, a similar experience, but you live in, a, in an era now where you can just talk about your experience of developing your career and find a following that would be interested in hearing that and make a career out of just that, you know, um, just with, with uh, YouTube and, and, you know, TikTok and Instagram and all the things out there. Um, but don't be afraid to, to work hard at delivering pizzas if you need to in order to make it work. You know, I've gotten other people that have done that, you know. So, uh, Chelsea, would you like to add something? Um, yeah, I, I fully agree with that. I had like a, a very different path, um, exactly as, as you just said, Louis. Um, and a lot of that was, I was like, ooh, I didn't feel like I could wait to like win a competition or have a gallery pick me up. I just had to start. Um, yeah, I think kind of the same way that you did. So I, I had a regular office job and worked at that while I was working on getting a portrait business up. And yep, mm -hmm. most of my livelihood at first was commissions. I've like since switched to teaching. Yeah. Um, and I get a lot of people, I made a YouTube video about how this looked and how I did it. And I have a lot of people as a result come and ask me <laughs> for mm -hmm. advice and I think the biggest thing is like just that tenacity yeah. and like being willing to fail over and over and like try different things and figure out what makes money and what doesn't and yep. not wait for someone to tell you you're good enough Yep. Um, yep. and keep going. Yeah, I think all of those things when we can even, I'd like for us to continue that conversation when we get back off break because I think there's some good stuff there and some good stuff where there's maybe resources and other um the other thing that i just wanted to point out that we were we actually were even discussing a little bit off camera is that you know well even the wealthy people out there all the wealthies <laughs> that that have a single business that they've typically made most of their money from you know typically av they average having up to six other revenue streams and that could be Real estate investments, you know, rental property that's managed by a management company, you know, um, anything that, you know, stock, you know, stocks and bonds and all those, you know, passive forms. But also, you know, if you see like, for example, um, Mr. Wonderful from Shark Tank, he's doing like a whole video thing right now on like how you should help structure your taxes so that you can be smart about getting yourself 
properly set up for your future business endeavors if you want to. Like, he wouldn't be doing that. He doesn't have to. And the guy's a billionaire. He doesn't have to do it. But he, he does those things because that you know they enjoy having different forms of revenue streams and extra ways of of figuring things out you know so we should also be encouraged to know that if you are doing this because you love it um, and you want to be in this field this field you have to it's one of the few fields you have to be a historian a philosopher a chemist uh, a physicist you know um, you have to be a craftsman, you know, there's so many things that you have to be that, um, you know, you might as well find the ones that you're really good at, you know, maybe you know a lot more about as a chemist than most people do. Maybe you can make paints and, you know, or maybe you know more about filming and so, and do what, kind of what we've done, which is kind of help put video content out for people. Mm -hmm. Um, but there's ways to do it. Now, that doesn't mean that it won't compromise some of your time. You most certainly have to pay, pay attention to balancing your time. But um, it's worth saying that it's, it, there are multiple ways to stay in the field you love and not just be a bartender if you don't want to be. But there's by far no reason, no, no, nothing wrong with doing that. I, I most certainly did that for three years. And actually, that just sort of going off that, when you were saying that there's this field has lots of different types of, you know, you could be this, you could be that. It was also, I was also thinking about how there's different types of painters. Like there's the painter that's really good technically who can like nerd out and like do really good, amazing academic portraits or drawings or whatever. Or then there's the painter that's really into narrative painting or whatever. Um, and, you know, obviously the best... Thing might might be to like bring them all together perfectly like harmoniously but one thing might lack the other so like figuring out like what type of um, painter are you I think yeah totally and being a fast painter you know um, like like Chelsea or being a very slow painter like me you know and realizing about yourself and and it's trying to strive for those goals and pushing towards a business model that allows for you to make an income in that field is really important, you know. Um, anybody, anything else anyone else had, had in that? Did anybody understand what I just said? <laughs> <laughs> oh, cool. Yeah, I, I think I'll just add that like, I think what sort of started the off camera part of that conversation was just that like, I think people have very rigid views of what it is to be a working full-time artist and most working full-time artists or even like very successful full-time working artists don't have the business model that you probably assume that they have um, and there is no like one legitimate way to do it yeah it's kind of like a, when you first start you as you make assumptions that everybody that's good works only from life. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, and right. that's all they do, and then they sell those, and then happily ever after, that's it. Yeah, and nope. that's just not reality, you know, a lot of, for yeah. a lot of people. Um, you know, if Stephen Asale, who I consider an incredible, incredible painter, um, he teaches, you know, uh, is it the National? Academy of Art, which Arts, or New York Academy Arts of Arts. Students? Oh yeah, maybe. Well, he also teaches, I think, at Art Students League, but um, like that's why he's one of his full-time gigs. But also, I you know I've I've ran into him teaching workshops at the same place I teach workshops at like Scottsdale Artist School, and you know had hung out and talked to him about it, and you know he's like one of the better painters in in my opinion of today, and you know. He's doing multiple revenue streams, you know, so it's like, well, it's good enough for him. Yeah. I feel like we could do a really interesting session that is just like dispelling common myths mm. about yeah. painting at a certain yeah. level. I think that's great. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to get that on the books for you. <laughs> that and 
left-handed painting or let's all sabotage one another with the colors we let ourselves paint with. Actually going into that. Um, someone asked, do you still, Lisa asked, do you still feel like painting is as well received by the public to purchase as a, another genre? I think, as in, is painting received as well as like other forms? I think that was like other jobs and stuff like that. I think that's what that means. Yeah, I feel weird when someone asks you what you do and you say like, I'm an artist. Because I assume that people have an immediate story in their head about like what that means. Oh, uh, you you see the immediate story come out. They go, oh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, my my wife has some great stories that she's a hygienist, and she'll be working on people's teeth, and she'll they'll ask like, what what does your husband do? Whenever she says something, she goes, oh, he's an artist, <laughs> and you immediately kind of like she says they you just see them go, oh. So you're the breadwinner in the family, you know, uh, yeah. <laughs> or something, and and then she's like, no, and then she feels like she has to always justify and like pulls out her phone, and shows them. So, um, but yeah, that and that's a thing. Um, Hold on, just a moment, everyone. Technical difficulties. All right, just checking everyone. Please somebody text in real quick and say that they st still have sound. We see somebody on Facebook saying that there's no sound. Can I see this? I can't hear anything through here either. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I I'm getting all, all right, cool. Alex at least says we have sound. <laughs> Liz, tell me, tell or Lisa uh, on Facebook. Let us know that you um, still have sound, so that we can make sure everything's on the up and up. I tell you, I'm I'm so impressed with. Uh, our model, she's just done such an incredible, mm -hmm. incredible job. So, any, so everyone can say no comment, but this, this is, is a question. question. Thoughts on Casey Barr and other artists being called out for scamming their customers. Thoughts on how this can affect someone's legacy. Um, well, does anyone have any immediate thoughts? Okay, I'll, um, yeah. I'll. <laughs> I'm, Well, I'm sure that it's not good for someone's legacy. Yeah, I was about to say, I was like, <laughs> the, the, the simple answer is like, yep, that, that, that's not something you want to have happen. Um, I think in any, any world, and this is not me, calling out Casey or, or the situation because I don't like to comment on too many things that I don't know too much about. However, I will say that um, you, I'm a big fan of an old motivational speaker named Zig Ziglar. And um, he was like a big business guru back in the 80s. And um, one of the things he says, if you want to be successful in business, the primary thing you should do is help somebody. And if the things that have come out are true, um, 
and what if anyone has a business where they feel like they're capitalizing on other people but they're not serving their people um, you're not helping somebody and um, and so I don't think it sheds a good light on anyone that if business practices are are conducted that way um, and I hope that it's not true however if it is, I hope at least that the people who have been wronged are at least um, compensated for it. So, um, and anyone else is welcome to jump in, but. Yeah, I feel like you, you, you got it. Do you think a realist artist like all of you with the amazing level that all of you have can say that you can live a very comfortable life, financially speaking? Yes. 100% um, yes. Um, I will say that most everyone in the U.S., <clears throat> you know, if you are making above $30,000 a year, you're in the 1% of the world. So, um, yes, you, I, think, I think just the U.S. alone um, has, a, has a privilege. Now, you know, I think a lot of times what the U.S. has a problem with is not a money-making problem, but a spending problem. So um, I do think that one of the biggest advices I give people when they become artists is to become debt-free first, uh, because it is hard. It doesn't mean that it's easy. Um, I most certainly, and my wife and I both, have made many sacrifices. Um, but at the same time, we, we most certainly live a very comfortable lifestyle. And, um, you know, we, we do things to help make ends meet. And one of them is that, you know, Al Alex and Divya are housemates of ours, and that makes this whole um, East Oak studio operate and operate well and work well. So. There's ways that there's ways around the situation and ways to be savvy. Yeah, I think um, we have obviously a lot of stories, or people have a lot of stories about like what it means to be a professional artist, and I I think we know that when we think about oh what what do other people think when we tell them what we do for a living, but. I think it's important to remember that we have those stories about ourselves too and like how much we could expect to make or earn or mm -hmm. like oh well so and so is such a like better painter than me but like they don't earn as much as i do and you can get into some weird kind of self sabotage because of that um so yeah i i think it's important to deconstruct and like demystify those kinds of myths. Mm -hmm. And he was, he also said in comparison with other professions such as a doctor or a business administrator in the US. Yep, still stands. I know artists that make as much as doctors. What'd you say? I said, tell us who <laughs> <laughs> Well, I know, most certainly Mark Maggi, where he does, he's doing okay. <laughs> I think that he makes probably the same amount as a doctor. Oh, wow. Just because he's kind of in that Western market? Well, yeah, and he's worked really hard and gotten him into a place, and he's, he's positioned himself with uh, galleries that really cheer, cheer him on and promote him well, and um, yeah. Um, is it a, someone asked, is it a misconception that most of the people that are able to pay for a three year of full training in a really good school like Florence Academy of Arts are wealthy or rich? Um, well, I, I'll tell this story, I've told it before, 
but when I went to, to Grand Central, um, you know, they, I, I tried to find ways to make it work and they used to always had like voluntary ways to like, you know, help make up for doing different things, services for them that would go towards your tuition. And they needed to be moved and I owned a moving company. Um, and they needed to be moved to uh, Queens and they were in Manhattan at the time. And so I, I basically asked if I could put my name in the hat and barter my tuition for the move. And I gave them an estimate on the move that would, basically the estimate was gonna cover a little bit more than what my tuition for the next two and a half years were gonna be. And, um, but I knew that it was gonna be cheaper than any moving company they could find in the area because I knew the market pretty well. And so um, they ended up hiring me to move the whole school and then I had my entire tuition paid for. So you can most certainly find ways to be very savvy um, to make things work. And um, <clears throat> no, you don't have to be a, a child of a wealthy person to make that happen. Um, someone says, I find it incredibly hard to try to get the level that you have just by watching videos of great painters without really having a guide or master. Um, if you have a chance, spend the money. I always say spend 3% on yourself, on your own learning. So if you have a chance to go to take, take some of the money, take 3% of whatever you're earning and put it towards um, a workshop or some other form uh, that you have personal interaction with an artist that will help you get to, to the next level and that could be helpful. Um, he says as well, do you know any do you know many Latin American painters that do realism and are currently making a good income? That was a very specific question. Um, what's his name? Nicholas Uribe? Uribe, oh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Nicholas Uribe is making a very good income for his area. Um, and, and so I would say... Yes, he has found a certain niche to, that allows for him to make a good income. Um, he says to just all the questions that you answered, uh, especially the one about sort of that you can make it as a painter as much as, you know, a doctor or whatever. He says, what a relief. You made me believe again that I could eventually make it. Oh, well, that, that means the world to me. Um, truly. And then um, Chelsea, the left. Talking about before, mm -hmm. someone, Jolene, says, I'm left handed, that works for me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, non dominant hand painting. <laughs> I rephrase. Although it's, it's funny, we got to the, I say we very generously, I was not participating, I was spectating, but my friends got to the end of that challenge and then realized they had to sign their names and like, Writing is difficult with your left hand. Writing, Ooh, like yeah. the English language, is designed to be done with your right hand. I think that's especially true when your paint is super wet. What was I just about to paint? Ah, got it. <laughs> I love that you speak out loud. It makes me feel <laughs> so much better. Um, the, the guy who you answered some questions for said, thanks for all your answers. They have been very honest and detailed. And then... Oh, you're welcome. Um, to the Ameri Latin American question, uh, Miriam Gar Gutierrez says Cesar Santos. Yeah. Yes, but he's in the well in the U.S. and Italy now, I think. Um, but yes, he most certainly is Cuban. Is he Cuban? Yeah, I think he is Cuban. I think he lives in Miami. He does, but I feel like I've seen posts of him living in Italy recently. Like in Florence. Yeah. Uh, well, Robert says, 
any of you experience injuries from painting too much and if so how do you deal with the pain or to avoid such You can take those with a grain of salt up until the point where you actually get injured. <laughs> so, <Yeah. laughs> like, I, I don't feel like I should jump in right away on this. I, I actually know something that I used to do. Uh, I used to scrunch my paper towel too hard, and it would actually, like, but it was, like, a short while. I think someone said they used to do it. May, Alex, maybe you did. I don't know. But anyways. Yeah, like it's like you get a certain like pain in your back from doing it too much or like keeping, yeah, the, the hand that your paper towel's in. Yeah. I feel like I've known artists to get an eye twitch. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yep, I am dealing with an eye twitch at the moment. <laughs> I know artists who have had, uh, mostly digital artists actually, have a lot of issues with carpal tunnel from mm -hmm. working, mm -hmm. from drawing and like leaning on a surface and doing very fine motor movements with your wrist, which thankfully as painters who are standing up and typically, okay, I'm, I have slightly different ergonomics than the two of you, but like painting a little bit more from my shoulder than my wrist helps mm -hmm. mitigate that. but. Anything where like you are slumped over a surface mm. is not good for your back. You do any digital art? I used to. Okay. I for a, for a while I thought surely this is the only way I could make money. Mm -hmm. um, turns out that's not my skill set. Gotcha. <laughs> um, but like yeah, for a long time that's how I worked. So yes, multiple people said that Caesar Santos has been living in Europe for years or one person that he moved to Florence to see her. So, but anyway, another question. Um, I'm a bit late, hi, hi, I'm a bit late to the party, so sorry if I'm being redundant. Do you recommend any must-do tips for self-taught artists interested in realism? In other words, is there any practice you swear by? Master studies. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah, just oh. easy one. Yeah, I, I, you know, um, I've done a couple of master studies, and uh, we've talked about that before on here a little bit. But that um, they are can be incredibly helpful to if you're trying to go. How did that person make that happen? And like going in like not only a deep dive study of the person, but just just trying to make you know color for color, value for value, what they what they did and sometimes you learn something that you didn't think you would learn by just looking at it. Yeah. So. Yeah, I want to do, I never, I mean, I did a couple. I even like got to do one in a museum once, but only like a start. But now more than ever, I want to do master copies. Mm. But I feel like I don't have the time because yep. of deadlines and stuff. All right, that's a good that's a good place for us to stop for a second. Oh, we have one more session after. Um, so, um, Sandy says hi, Chris. Hi, so oh wait, sorry, hi. I must be like Chris. Um, she was. I didn't know you were here, Chris. <laughs> Chris is Mr. Bones in the box. <laughs> um, she says, hi Chris, to someone else in the chat. But then she says, hi East Oaks, and East Oaks Studio and Lewis, I'll see you at the, um, the East Oaks Studio and Lewis, I'll see you at the Portrait Society Conference. Oh, well, I'm excited. I'm excited to see, to see you. Who, wait, who did you say this was? Chris? Oh wait, sorry, oh. Sandy. Sandy was done. I feel like... We're, we're having oh Sandy oh yeah uh, awesome so excited to see you Sandy um, you need to stop by the studio sometime we would love to have you come by um, but yes no love it We'd love to see you
I feel like when I all the prima paint, I always have an itch problem. And I mean that in like the like, hi, my my name's Lewis. I have an itch problem. <laughs> and everybody goes, hi, Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> mm. um, someone says, thanks for answering. My master copies sound like a great idea, and I might even buy a standing easel to avoid hunching over my desk. Smiley face. Yay! Oh, that's great. Uh, here, while we're on that subject, and you get a standing thing, I want to go ahead and forewarn you that, that this first few days of standing, that um, it is, is going to hurt. Um, but after that, it, it is so good for your posture, but you like, and all the things that relate to your body, it's good for your heart, it's good for um, your mechanics, so, and for the fact that you get to get really close to your painting and it's not straining. I was about to say, you get, you get to very easily get very far away from your painting. <laughs> well, that too, yeah. quickly. <laughs> yeah, very naturally. You get out of your chair every time. Yeah. But um, just note that as your posture is repositioning itself, it sometimes is painful. Um, so I thought I would go ahead and just throw that out there. So Sandy Bostein asked, has anyone tried any of the new non-cadmium -cad yellow red green paints? I have not. No, I have not either. Red green paints. Yeah. I have to, who who makes them? Sand. Uh, I'm not sure. Just non cadmium yellow and red green paints. Uh, maybe she'll re um, reply because she asked you asked that. But yeah, she didn't say. Um, well, now I'm intrigued to at least see. I tell you, green is the just such a hard color to. You know, yeah. um, it's it's so easy to overpower things with green that I'm finding myself all the time like, what is wrong with this? And it's like I need to neutralize the green more, you know. So, um, so I might try them, but I'm not a huge fan of making my greens too chromatic because I just have a hard time controlling them when they do. Yeah. Do you find that to be the same case for you, Chelsea? Um, so when I was thinking to that question, also, hi, Sandy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, is that my personal solution to like wanting to not have cadmium around me any more than necessary is to not put it on my easel any more than necessary. So mm -hmm. for instance, on this painting, there's no reason for me to have a cadmium on here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like it could potentially be convenient, but like, if I didn't get the right colors on her, that is a me problem, not a my palette problem. Yeah. Um, so I, I typically try to limit, like when I put more questionable pigments on my palette, I do it because I know specifically I need that color for that painting. Same thing with like Gamsol. Um, I typically try not to like leave it open if I'm not actively using it for something. I mean, we're, I, yeah, just, <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> I have the same thing. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so. So which one, what do you think is the worst one? Lead white, cadmiums, or leaving your Gamsol tin open? I think leaving your Gamsol open. I totally. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, heavy metals is one thing, but if you do a really good job of keeping your hands washed, it, it's far better than something that is odorless, that's floating through the air. And that you're breathing, breathing all, the all the time. Yep. You're not paying attention to it. And like, it's fine if it's just like one time or, or just a few times, but if it's like every day like we are, I literally have my Gamsol right next to my air filter. It yeah. just sits right in front of my air filter. So. What, um, what if you have a tiny little pot thing that everyone here probably has, that has a little, like the tiniest bit of gam salt mixed with linseed. Oh, I don't think that's a problem. Okay. That's, not, that's so little that um, I don't. I really just don't think it's going to make that big of a difference, mm -hmm. honestly. Um. So back to the uh, cadmium question. Uh, 
Sal Sandy Bostein says, Windsor and Newton, there's a red, a green, looks like cad green pale, and a nice yellow, looks like cad yellow light. Okay, so there's a red and a green. That's where I was getting confused. Oh. I thought she was saying there's a cad, like a cadmium red green. And I was like, man, that is a, that's a color I have to change. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's some, like cadmium that's some, brown. That's magic color right there. <laughs> you get both compliments in the same color. Um, I want some of whatever he's having. <laughs> so, uh, Alex Tabbitt says this might sound amateur, but is there any way to neutralize parts of a dried painting without having to remix and repaint everything, perhaps through a glaze? To find neutralize. Well, maybe he'll define that soon. Uh, well, Alex, were you going to say something? I, well, I just put a glaze on one of my paintings and I used a mix of like black and Payne's gray and just glazed over the whole thing. And oh, yeah. it didn't neutralize it. And I can't think of any other way you would get a more like neutral color unless you glaze blue over it or something, I don't know. What about um, black? That's what I said. Oh, I think well, it's Payne's Gray. Yeah, I use black and Payne's Gray mixed together, but it basically did the same thing as just the black. Mm -hmm. I'm and sure you could. And yes, he said neutralize as in desaturate. Gotcha. So yeah. how do you think it worked well? Well, at least that. I don't think it really desaturated it. It just changed the color harmony slightly. Because I think that's the answer I would have gave. But then I just did it and yeah, didn't quite work. So, um German is his name. He says, have you guys met Nick Arm personally? That's a, that's a great question. He was literally one of the first people that I um, met at Portrait Society in 20, like 2009 or 2010. And it was his first time in the States. He was not famous and he didn't know anybody. And I was in the room with the finalists and I just walked up to him and I was like, you look like somebody that, you know, um, is new here too, and this is my first time, and I'm Lewis. And he's like, oh, my name's Nick. And we, we hung out the whole week. And lo and behold, like two years later, he becomes like this big name in, in the painting world. And it was just me, him, and Teresa Oaxaca, and we were all hanging out the whole time uh, together. And, you know, we did pretty much everything that, that Porsche Society. And that was like the first year I'd ever gone. And I remember coming back and being like, these are my people, <laughs> you know. And uh, so it's really cool to see his success since then. Um, you know, I'm quite um, proud of him in the sense that I think he, I'm, I'm happy for his success. Yeah. Certainly no role. Success. Um, he says he is not on social media much. It would be very interesting to get to know more about his process. Well, I do think he does workshops, so give that a give that a try. Mm -hmm. And see, you know, now of course his are like overseas and probably very expensive, but um, I would still think it's worth seeing um, what's available. I think there's a lot that you can learn from like looking at what he does have on social media too. You know, you can tell from that process, if we're talking specifically about the oil pieces, you know, he will like, I love Nick's pieces in progress. So I've like spent a lot of time looking at them, but you know, he, he'll kick off with like a Brunei um, of one figure and it'll just be scrubbed in. It'll be like this kind of haze around one figure's face and then he'll do that for each successive figure, and then you can tell like the color is added in 
as a secondary piece, not necessarily like glazing, but just you can tell by the way the works in progress go up that like he does them in stages and he like breaks them down and tackles them part by part. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if there's like a specific process question, but uh, yeah, I always thought that was something interesting about like Nick's work and I I'm like really drawn to his pieces that are like half finished. Yeah. Like a lot of the reason why I work the way I do is because I was like, oh, what if I made something inspired by what Nick is doing, but then I just called it done yeah. <laughs> instead of like continuing to paint on it. So many times I'm impressed by work done finished and I ask myself the question, would I have been able to do that? Would I have been able to say it's done at that stage? And it, it then allows me to go, I should really consider what I'm doing you know? <laughs> um, and try every now and again and just go, nope, <laughs> done, <laughs> and just leave it. <laughs> I am very impressed with his um, watercolor snow pieces. Yeah. So nice. The watercolors that look like oils, I'm just like, how did you do this? <laughs> yeah. Has anyone here tried watercolor? Years ago. I haven't tried it recently. I need to uh -huh. um, retry it again. I think, um, I think there's something to learn there. Yeah. Alex, have you tried watercolor? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I'm sure I played with it one time in high school art class, but I don't think that counts. <laughs> Alex, where did you go to art school initially? You said you dropped out of a program? Yeah, uh, VCU, Virginia Commonwealth oh. University. Mm -hmm. Did you have, um, I'm curious if it is like my experience of uh-huh. Yeah, I'm sure it is. Yeah. Uh, because if Ole Miss is the same experience that you had, yeah. then VCU probably only is just uh, that on steroids. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Got assigned a sculpture project where my medium was either paper plates or aspirin. <laughs> that tells you a story about... <laughs> That art <laughs> curriculum. Yep. I gotta be in that class. We got, we got a reaction there, Vanessa, on that one. Yeah, stay like that. <laughs> hold it, hold that, hold that pose. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, I had to make something out of trash, but yours is much more interesting and specific. <laughs> yeah. Oh, did it make you like big, angry? I'm just like, what am I doing? That one, that was at the very beginning. I was like, okay. <laughs> yeah. But then I had to do a public, um, what's it called when you do an art piece? Is... Oh, uh, it begins with an I. I don't know what you're talking about. Public what? Performance art. Uh, performance art. Yeah, like oh, I had man. to do a public performance piece. This sounds like your nightmare. It. No, it is. It was my nightmare. Yeah, yeah. That that that's your artist nightmare. Yeah. We were talking about earlier. Yeah. So I dropped out instead of doing. It. <laughs> See. Oh my gosh, that's a really good story. It is. It's a fantastic story. <laughs> and the funny part is, when you go to drop out, you're like, yeah. So I, I want to drop out. What do I have to do? And they're just like, stop showing up. Oh man. And I'm okay. like, wait, really? And then that's when you kind of start to realize this shit is a sham. Yeah. yeah. Like, oh, yeah. Stop showing up. Okay. Um, Wiza says the way Alex uses mass in his piece looks very similar to Nick Arm. It's very inspiring and beautiful. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate that. Got the Nick Arm badge. <laughs> I honor. <laughs> Nick Olive, if you're listening, I, 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 I truly mean that. <laughs> oh, yeah.
Yeah, I remember Odd Nurgen talking about Nick because he went there and he's just like, he has the hand of Zorn. Just really high what? praise. Oh, this looks very different with glasses on. <laughs> I love your life. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I feel like that would have thrown me. Trying to like fix all my edges before it was too late. How, what is your guys' process in talking and painting at the same time? Like, how do you guys handle that? I, I don't think I still can, honestly, and I feel like I'm still learning how to handle that. But um, this is our 24th one, so, and y'all are still around, so evidently y'all can at least tolerate me. Yeah, I feel like it's like a fake it till you make it kind of thing. It, it really does scrub your brain, though. Like, sometimes when, when I first started doing this, I was exhausted. You know? Yeah. I was just like, wow. I wonder if there's a painter out there that, like, needs someone to talk to, and, like, that's how they get in the flow kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Not music, but, like, conversation. I could see that, like, talking on the phone while you paint. Louie, you're pretty good at that. Yeah, or, I do that from time oh, yeah. to time. My, my brothers will call and we're pretty tight. And uh, there's very few people I'll talk to on the phone while I'm painting. And one of them is my brother and my mom because I know that they can hold the conversation pretty much themselves. <laughs> and I can just like, laugh and, and make the odd comment every now and again. So. And I, I, I can always tell who you're talking to. Yeah, because my southern accent starts coming out. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my parents are, my whole family's from Mississippi, so um, mom gets on the phone. Hey! I think everyone's at that tail end of trying to concentrate and get it. Yeah. Everyone uncovered some ground. Like, no one missed, you know what I mean? Like, normally there's like, I did everything, but there's that section. Everyone seems to uncover everything. Yeah, I noticed we had a like very fast start today. Like, everyone had color before the end of the first mm. sitting. Like my my oh, back girl. was my back said that it was done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Excuse me if you hear rule. Oh, I thought that was me. <laughs> I'm in the same boat as you. Me too. Chelsea, I remember those brownies you made at Adam's when I ate seven. <laughs> that makes me really happy. <laughs> I remember it very clearly. I don't know, man. That sounds like some special brownies. <laughs> that can be a, a different. More hungry and more hungry. Oh my god. <laughs> Get Chelsea in trouble before she leaves. I, f I feel like if we did that, we just wouldn't paint. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, I'm tired. You want to go to Taco Bell anyone? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> East Stokes goes to Taco Bell. <laughs> Um, Alex, Lisa would like to know what brush you are using. Yeah, it's a rosemary extra long comber, which is what's giving all the kind of scratchy, wispy stuff. And then 
an eclipse lung flat, which is sort of like a comber, just less, less wispy. They all look decently pretty big. Like, did, is that correct? Like the brushes you're using? Actually, no. The, well, first off, this painting is really small. And then, so in relation to it, it's pretty big, but it's like the smallest extra long coma that they have, which is really hard to use because it's so flimsy. Yeah. You have to get like a lot of paint. Yeah. I find that those splay really easily too. Yeah. The, the very small comers. Yeah, you know what's funny? I also bought recently on eBay some mongoose brushes that still exist in the world. Nice. And uh, yeah, I use that a little bit at the beginning. And, and how like, did you find it? Well, I really liked it. I'm like, don't get used to this. <laughs> yeah, they, they have a particular feeling for sure. Was that rosemary or did you think that? No, I wish I could find rosemary ones. It's Langnickel, which was like the brushes that Jeremy Lipking used before, like, you know, rosemary was a thing or before he started using rosemary. And now, the next day, they'll all be gone from eBay because I said it <laughs> on YouTube. I guess the whole uh, YouTube world gave up on us. <laughs> Don't hear any more questions. They're like, how are they gonna finish? How are they gonna finish? Yeah, I like that glow. It's nice. Oh! Cool. <laughs> <laughs> we scared Vanessa right at the very end. <laughs> Love it. Well, everybody, thank you so much for joining us. I hope that we get to see some of you at Portrait Society this next week. I'll be there teaching a workshop and a drawing thing. Feel free to reach out to me, say hey to me. Uh, also, I'll be teaching a workshop in uh, Scottsdale, Arizona. If anyone is interested in the last few slots that we have available, uh, we'd love to see you out there. Uh, come join me and we'll talk about how to create poetry in, in your portrait. And um, thank you to Vanessa for being yeah. here, and Chelsea and Alex and Vivian behind the, uh, the switcher. And we look forward to seeing all of you in the future. Have a great day.